are there psychiatric problems that run in your family? Depression runs in families. Bipolar disease runs in families. Mm. If you have that in your family, you have to treat yourself differently than someone who doesn't. Okay. And you have to be aware of those kinds of symptoms and being willing to address them. This podcast, Coach, is it's a, it's like transformational podcast, right? So okay. it's for people that really want to learn in all categories of life. And I wanted you to come on this podcast because you're a neurologist. You studied the human brain all throughout your life to get to where you are today. Okay. What do you do? Like, what do you define your job as? And what is neurology to you? To me, neurology is the study and care of diseases of the nervous system. And the nervous system is primarily two components. There's the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. And then there's the peripheral nervous system which are the nerves outside of the central nervous system within the chest and the abdomen and the limbs. Awesome. So how did you get into this field in the first place? Like how did that all start? I became a doctor because my father was a doctor. The, there was no other reason than that. When I was in uh, college, I was a pre-med major. Mm -hmm. One day I went to see my advisor. He said, I'm sorry, but your grades aren't good enough to get into medical school. I had like a 3.3 average. And back then you needed almost a 4.0 to get into medical school. <laughs> so he said, you better figure out something else you might want to do. So I decided to become a minor in education and become a school teacher. <laughs> and I taught eighth grade science, about halfway through that year, I realized I could not continue <laughs> as an eighth grade science teacher. So I had some uh, information that you use to study for the boards for medicine called the MCATs. Ah. And I had saved it. I took a course the, the summer before. But instead of taking the course and going to it, I would go to the Red Brick School in Lewiston and play basketball. <laughs> so I did not learn from that. But then I decided while I was teaching, I was going to use that information. I studied hard. I got a good score. I applied to medical school, and they accepted me. So it took me a couple of years after college mm -hmm. to get into medical school. Awesome. And once I was in medical school, um, you rotate at different hospitals and different things, like you might do cardiology or gastroenterology. Mm -hmm. And I, my last two uh, elective, I was a senior, I had two electives at the very end. And I called the Cleveland Clinic, that's where my father did his residency. Mm -hmm. And I said, w what can I do? You know what, I'd like to do uh, two rotations there. And they said, well, I said, can I do cardiology and GI? Because that's what I knew the most about, and I, I would look more intelligent. <laughs> yeah. They said, I'm sorry, all we have is, is neurology oh. and uh, alcoholism. Alcoholism? Yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> that's something I'll definitely talk about. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay. And I did my neurology rotation, and I met a really smart uh, intern in neurology and the attending in neurology was really smart, really nice. And all of a sudden I decided I want to be a neurologist. Wow. What, what was it about that? Like got like, so when you started doing, you know what I liked about it is the same thing I like about it now. I like the fact that your job is to figure things out more mm. than any other profession mm. in, in medicine. Mm. Yeah. So I, I like that task. It was very interesting to me. And so I said, can I apply to the program? They said, no, I'm sorry, we're all filled. So two weeks later, I'm doing my alcoholism rotation. Uh -huh. And my friend Jack Ann Standick, who was the intern, comes to me and said, there's an opening in neurology. 
if you apply now, maybe you can get in. Mm. So I applied, and within two weeks, I was accepted. Wow. So I got accepted in probably, if not the best, one of the best. Cleveland Clinic? Cleveland Clinic, the yeah. biology program. Wow. So I always say about that, better to be lucky than good. You know? <laughs> that's I, great. I, I, I believe that's true. Yeah, that's, that's totally awesome. Okay, so like figuring out the problem, that's, I can see that's what intrigues me a lot with like the work I do as well. All right, so. It's probably similar. Yeah, in, in yeah. ways, in ways, because. You know, we got to analyze things, kind of diagnose it, right? And then kind of prescribe something to fix it. And you have to be, more than anything, a really good listener. Correct. Right? Correct. Analyzer. Yes. Right? A very good analyzer, right. which is a ton of different components, really. That's that's number one, I think. Even any doctor. They've done studies. On average, a doctor will listen to a patient for less than five seconds before they start talking. On average. And they just miss everything that's important. Holy shit. But it, it's true. <laughs> it's true. How, on average, how much do you think you could listen? You know what? I say sometimes I'm having a bad day and <laughs> I'm cl- get close to the five seconds. <laughs> but most of the time, I'll let them talk until they're done. Yeah. 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 So one of my questions I, I wrote down was people. some people may come in with conditions of the brain that are kind of undiagnosable undiagnosable right or right how do you know that um well, just, i mean i study things you've had a few yourself <laughs> <laughs> i had a few mental disorders myself. but you know kind of speaking on the mental health topic some people may come in and, and not know what's kind of going on with them or it may not even be a disorder that's even invented or found yet right it's just kind of things they're doing in their daily life that's like in affecting their their mind their their state of mind what what do you see the things that people are doing like that are just not healthy for them? Is there anything like that? Yeah, I I think that we're kind of now getting to the realm of neurology and psychiatry, you know, mm. and they're not the same, but they're similar. And but for all mental health, um, physical activity on a daily basis for all neurologic health is important. Mm. Uh, Social activity, being around people that love you and that you love Uh, is important. Very. Right? And intellectual activity, cards, board games, Mm. whatever, crossword puzzles, whatever it is that you enjoy in particular. Mm. There isn't a game that's the best or, but if there is something that you're enjoying, reading, they say writing, I know you're a writer. I think they say writing is the highest level of intellectual activity that you can actually perform. Yeah. So when I see patients who are have dementia, may have Alzheimer's disease, that question is what the family always asks. What will what what can we do? You know what's important. Physical is number one, social uh, and intellectual is number two. Physical is actually number one, believe it or not. Well, why? Why? why is... I don't know why that is because I have a hard time believing. I, I just know what the studies say. Uh-huh. But why that is, I don't feel like I know that answer. Mm-hmm. But it's true. Patients usually come with families, especially if there's a neurologic disorder of any substance. Mm. And families come in this order daughter almost always what do you mean so, oh, okay so the, uh, this is the hierarchy of who shows up with with the patient right uh-huh. so and if it's an old older patient number one is daughter number two is daughter-in-law Wow. number three is son there's a thing to being a woman and being a caregiver and that's real and so I see that in my office, and I talk to other doctors, it's the same thing. But when they, anyway, when they're there, they, they want to know, how, how can I help? How can we help? What can we do? Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes there's medicine that's helpful, and there's testing that needs to be done. But we always talk about physical, social, intellectual activity. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're on it, for the most part, yeah. you know. 
the, the patient is like, oh, God, I got <laughs> Yeah. But she, it's, and I, and I don't, if you just want to talk about Alzheimer's disease, I know that there are no drugs that will slow down the rate at which Alzheimer's progresses. I know that. Mm. Not just me, but the whole world. There are a few drugs that can maybe help day-to-day memory in an Alzheimer's patient. In general, on average, they work poorly and they have side effects. Right, and Alzheimer's is just like what, like essentially the eating away of the brain? Alzheimer's is the, is the most common cause of dementia in the United States. So if you just take 10,000 people with dementia, over 500 of them will have Alzheimer's disease. Which it's a specific disorder. The body is making extra proteins mm. in the form of plaques mm. and tangles, and they're crushing the nerve cells. Mm. Slowly. Which store your memories. Exactly. And, and your cognitive abilities, right? So uh, forgetfulness is the most common cause, or the most common symptom. Mm-hmm. Uh, language problems. Mm. Trouble coming up with words. And what areas of the brain are, 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 does that mostly affect? Does that the affect? hippocampus and the temporal lobes of the brain, which are like inside of where your ears are, about two inches. Yeah. But it also affects frontal lobes. And over time, it's the whole brain that gets affected mm-hmm. over time. Mm-hmm. Alzheimer's runs in the family. Mm. So do I. My mother had Alzheimer's when she died. Two of her brothers died of Alzheimer's, and her sister, who's alive, has it. Mm. So my generation will be the first generation, probably, that will be on a medicine to treat Alzheimer's. Wow. Um, Can you tell me about, uh, before we get into a little bit about alcoholism, which I think is really important to talk about, how can somebody's emotional state affect their physical state? Or have you even seen cases like Oh, that? no doubt. And that is... I almost feel like you can talk more about that than I can. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's true. It, it, it can. And, and it's the same thing. You know, you got the underlying brain pathology, mm-hmm. and then you got their in, um, physical state... And then you got their psyche. Mm. So if something very stressful happens to you, parent dies, lose a job, everything happens at once, that can make your brain go awry, cause you to be depressed, cause you to be anxious. If you can find a way to stabilize all that while all these negative things are happening, you're better off by doing what? Same kind of thing something physical Mm. every day, being with people that you love and love you, and something intellectual. You're a writer. Writing is the best, I told you that, and Mm. and I I believe it's true. So those are the kinds of things, if you need to talk to somebody, if if you have personal stresses to the point where you feel like you need some sort of counseling, Mm -hmm. psychologist, social worker, for a lot of people that makes a big difference. Yeah. I think that's all I have to say about yeah, that. Yeah, no problem. So, you you mentioned earlier that alcoholism is, was some, one of the things you studied at the Cleveland Clinic. Right. Can you tell me about that and, uh, you know, just how that affects the brain, really, alcohol? Yeah, so, uh, alcoholism is a dependency uh, on alcohol. I... I heard a joke once that what's the definition of an alcoholic? And the answer is someone who drinks more than I do. <laughs> so, nobody thinks they are, huh? That's right, exactly. That's what I tell my patients who I believe are alcoholics. That's a good one. Yeah. So it's a genetic disorder often. It runs in families, no doubt. Uh, excessive alcohol consumption can lead to a multitude of neurological disorders. There's something called peripheral neuropathy. It can damage the nerves in the feet, mm. make your feet numb, and make it hard to walk with balance. So, what's the what what's is there an amount that defines alcoholism? Or yeah, is that I, different? 
I think um, drinking on a regular basis to the point of intoxication or near intoxication. And what is intoxication? How do you define that? Is um, alcohol's negative effect on your awareness, Mm. your balance, your coordination, your memory. Mm. And we're not just talking about like very Uh, little, but we're talking about maybe... uh, For most people, it's multiple drinks, like, um, I don't know, how long, how much does it take for you to get drunk? Uh, well, drunk, I'm not quite sure, but, like, after, like, one beer, I'll feel a difference. I'll feel a difference. You know, American Lex- Medical Association says, say, says men should not drink more than two alcoholic beverages a day and women one. Mm. Okay. And that's to limit uh, chance of addiction and damage to the body. Okay. Um, Alcohol causes weight gain. If you've seen most people who drink a lot, they got a there's a beer gut. There's a gut. There's, there's a deposition deposition of fat that occurs in the abdominal cavity. Mm-hmm. That's not very pleasing to look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, it affects the balanced part of the brain called the cerebellum. It can cause damage to the thinking part of the brain, the cortex. Mm-hmm. Is this really a nasty drug? What would you, what would you recommend somebody, or how how they should, kind of, what should their relationship be to alcohol? Do you feel like what's your, what's your stance on that? Yeah, I don't know that I'm uh, an expert on that. <laughs> yeah. I, I I know how to recognize alcoholism. Yeah. I, I know where to send people. Uh-huh. I know how to talk to them. Yeah. To try to get them to accept the fact that it's time yeah. to discontinue. <laughs> um, but that's often the hardest thing. Yeah. Sometimes they don't come in until they're like that guy you were describing. Mm. They're end stage. Mm. And their only chance is to quit, but they can't. And they go to rehab, and they come home, and they start drinking again. It's, it's, it's a very difficult yeah. to overcome. The best way is to not get into that place in the in the first place. Yeah. Uh, can you describe the stages of that? And like how, how it kind of starts? If you if, if a patient ever described you, like, oh, I started off, you know, drinking when I was 18. And, you know, I, I think that the, often the clue, you see more alcoholic men than women, but it's pretty darn close. Mm-hmm. But the clue that I usually uh, hone in on is what the spouse is saying. Mm-hmm. You know, they, the person that's in for a problem, maybe they have neuropathy, and you say, oh, uh, do you drink? And they say, yeah, I might have three mm-hmm. a day. And the wife is sitting behind the guy going, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a lot more, but you have to get the information sometimes from the spouse or a loved one to get yeah. accurate information. Because people who drink too much often underestimate or confabulate as far as how much they're drinking. Yeah. Awesome. Can you give me some, like, what are the, I would say, if you can, you know, what are some of the craziest things or disorders or, like, things you ran into or something that was just really memorable to you? I think one thing that I always remember. Yeah when I see someone with this condition is Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig's disease is also called motor neuron disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And it's a disorder where the motor nerve cells within the base of the brain, the brainstem, and the spinal cord start to degenerate. Mm. And what happens to a person is they have progressive weakness their muscles atrophy and their muscles twitch. And it gets to the point where they become wheelchair bound, they can't swallow, uh, eventually they end up on a respirator and they die usually within three years. And what was the youngest person you seen with this disease? Yeah, you know, and I, I saw a person 
I, when I did my residency at the Cleveland Clinic, the doctor that I trained with, his name is Hiroshi Mitsumoto. He's the head of the Eleanor and Lou Gehrig Center in New York City. Mm. And he, he left Cleveland to take that job. Anyway, when I worked with him three days a week in his clinic, I would see Lou Gehrig's patients from all over the world. They would come to see him. Mm -hmm. So because I got that experience, I could carry that on to this practice here in Buffalo, mm -hmm. and I was able to diagnose people, oh. I think, more readily. And you always know, you know, there's one thing about this group of patients, they have the greatest personality. They're, mm -hmm. they're kind and gentle Maybe. souls. I don't know why that is. Wow. You, you never see one that's not like, like wow. that. That's interesting. Uh, so I always remember, you know, not very often, like I maybe see two people a year with Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, those, there are so many other cases that if I could remember them would be really interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. That's <laughs> but totally I don't fun. think I can. <laughs> that's I, cool. I can't. Yeah, I see, I'm seeing a woman right now whose, fa whose husband was... Uh, internal medicine doctor when I first started at the Buffalo Medical Group. Mm. And she came in because this leg was shrunken and weak. She couldn't pick it up. She couldn't straighten it out. The other leg's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. She's lost 20 pounds and she has a history of breast cancer. So I did all the testing, I scanned her back, I scanned the rest of her spine, I did a nerve test on her leg, mm -hmm. and everything was fine, except for this leg is weak. There's, there's a problem with the nerves going to that leg. So I sent her to the Dent Neurologic Institute, which is everyone's sort of dent. Mm -hmm. And I called them and I said, you know, this is what's happening, could you please give me a hand here? I thought maybe they would um, do some special imaging. So yesterday I get a call from the patient. She said they've done all their tests and everything's normal. I want to come back and see you. I said, okay. Well, did they do a spinal tap? Mm. Because when my letter to them, I said, Pl could you please do a spinal tap? And mm. the reason would be is Sometimes you get what's called meningeal carcinomatosis, where breast cancer or any other kind of cancer might spread to the central nervous system and encircle nerves mm. going down like into a leg. Mm. And sometimes you don't see that on the scan. Mm. Wow. So if you take a sample of the flu of fluid and you send it to the pathologist, Sometimes you can see cancer cells there. Wow. So I don't have the answer to this case. You can ask me next time you see me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, she was sent for a spinal tap, which is supposed to be done next week. Wow. What effects are there? And really, what are your thoughts on that notion that I've at least anecdotally seen people act as if there's zero effects, side effects of marijuana? There are no known side effects. And I think for the most part, the reason that it was recently legalized is because it's safe. But it's not like there can't be some problems with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest issue is this apathy that goes along with it. Certainly it can affect someone's life in a negative way. Uh, so that happens and that's a, that's a real thing. It's not a treatment for anxiety. I've seen a number of studies looking at marijuana and the treatment of anxiety. I mean, people will take it because they feel anxious, and apparently it must feel, they must feel better. But if you measure um, all of the different aspects of anxiety, how it makes someone feel in, me in a measurable way, it's not helpful. Mm. In fact, it potentially, for some people, could actually make that worse. Well, I don't have a problem with marijuana. I, I don't smoke marijuana. I never have. I just don't feel like 
I don't feel like I need whatever it's supposed to give me. Yeah. But I understand why people smoke. I prescribe it for my patients, mm. but it's for pain. Mm. So if they have pain that I can't help, I, I wrote a prescription the other day for a guy who had really bad neuropathy pain. Mm -hmm. And it can, it can help them. Yeah, with well, pain, right. but not really so mental anxiety. I, I, there's no definitive proof that it's helpful for anxiety, mm -hmm. for an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing about marijuana that <clears throat> puzzles me, and I don't know the answer to it, is, and maybe you guys know the answer to it, if you get pulled over when you're drinking, they can do a breathalyzer and see how much alcohol is in your system. Mm -hmm. How do they measure... Yeah. How much weed <laughs> mm -hmm. or THC? Yeah, like they would have to get you to a hospital. But do, do, is that ever done? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, marijuana can affect your judgment and yeah. coordination if you smoke enough, doesn't it? Yeah, I would say yes, but not to the point where it's like alcohol at all. Like it definitely doesn't like really. It really doesn't change your motors, fine motor skills like that. Yeah, like it really. Yeah, like maybe you just you just feel. You can recognize someone who is, quote, stoned. High. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. From, like, eyes. Right. And sometimes they're way more giggly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. Like, those signs. Right. But, yeah. I, Do you know anybody that's been given a ticket from yeah, marijuana? I think, I, think my, I think my mom, actually, has been given because she was in, like, a bad car accident. Or a biking accident. She was, she was. Oh, she has a prescription for it. Correct. Given a ticket. Oh, a ticket. No, no, marijuana never. Marijuana intoxication. No, driving. I just feel like they can't tell. Like they, they just, they just don't yeah. know. And if they, if they smell weed in your car, they'll just give you, they'll find the weed and then ticket you for that or whatever. Right. But they can't really anymore. Right. <laughs> so, they're. I'm sure Do they're trying think, to figure you out think something. You're impaired. Not for driving. No. Do you think you don't feel like? Impaired? But newbie people, yes. People that don't smoke weed generally, yeah, yeah, he'll be easily affected uh, with your motor skills for sure. But people that you know will, are used to it more, more yeah. regular, yeah. then no, they'll be they should be fine. You should be fine. Everybody's different, but you know, a kid that's sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, yeah. first time, first few times smoking weed, I would highly recommend never to get behind a car. <laughs> it will. Yeah, and you know, how do you think? What are the negative effects of marijuana? People smell it on you. So they may judge you. Okay. Um, also, I mean, I honestly... How about how it affects you as a being? It makes you more tired as well, yeah. I feel yeah. like. Well, I'm a general neurologist, which means I see everything in neurology. Uh -huh. I do not have specific training in one part. Mm -hmm. Like classically, there are epileptologists... They take care of people with epilepsy. There are stroke specialists. Mm -hmm. There are MS specialists. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's all these different at peripheral nerve specialists, neuromuscular specialists. So I'm everything. Mm -hmm. wow. And and seeing everything, there are certain like recurrent things that a general neurologist would see. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're seeing... Um, I think more of, and I think it's because we have more treatments that are effective and people are starting to come and to get treated, are headaches. Mm. Most common cause of headache is migraine, by far. Migraines cause migraine. headaches. Mi migraine is the most common cause of headache. I thought a migraine was a terrible headache. No, migraine is a form of headache. It's a type of headache. Mm. So a migraine headache in general, on average, is on one side of the head. In general, on average, is throbbing in character, is moderate to severe in degree, is associated with nausea, people have to lie down, bright light and loud noise bothers them, mm -hmm. runs in the family. Mm -hmm. If you got headaches like that, you have migraines. Now, there are some things called regular migraines where it's kind of like that but not as bad. But migraine headache treatment has kind of morphed a little bit over the last couple of years. About 20 years ago, there were these drugs called triptans, like sumatriptan or imitrex. Mm -hmm. 
And that changed things because it was a drug you could take at the beginning of a migraine and a half hour was gone. Mm. You never had anything like that. Now, then, then this drug called Topamax, which was an epilepsy drug, mm. you could give it every day, twice a day, and someone's headaches went from five times a week to once a week. Mm. Now, the latest are these calcitonin antagonists. One is a shot. Mm. You give it once a month in your thigh. Mm -hmm. And after three months, your headache frequency drops 60, 70, 80. So I've had people just say their headaches are gone. Oh, wow. This is just new <clears throat> science, new technology. Yeah. And you can take and this shot Form, you could take it as a pill at the onset of a headache. So we have all these, and people see the commercials of these things on TV, mm -hmm. and then they end up in your office because they want to know about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I have after, after they've been suffering for all these years. Mm -hmm. But you know what the, the basic thing is with headaches? Yeah. Are you drinking too much caffeine? Mm -hmm. Mini caffeine withdrawal headaches. Mm, coffee. Coffee, big time. Mm -hmm. Person come in with a headache every day for five years. How much coffee do you drink? Eight cups. Holy shit. <laughs> they get off the coffee, all of a sudden, they don't need to come back anymore. Yeah. So caffeine is a, is a biggie. Painkillers. Mm. So you start getting headaches, and so you start taking painkillers. Mm -hmm. And after a while... Taking a painkiller triggers another headache, so you take another painkiller. Holy shit. So you get these analgesic withdrawal headaches. Mm. And then the last thing is depression. Half of the people with migraine have depression, half the people with depression have migraine. <sighs> so if you don't ask those depression questions and you don't treat that, then the headaches will continue. Mm. So to me, I, you know, we see a lot of really tough headache patients. Those are the three things that I ask them. I ask them about what their headaches are like, but I want to know, are they doing too much caffeine? Sometimes it's Pepsi, sometimes it's Diet Pepsi, which is even worse because of the aspartame in it. Yeah, I've heard. The artificial sweetener brings yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Are they doing caffeine? Are they taking painkillers? And are they depressed? Mm-hmm. Does depression cause headaches? Some people inherit the genetic predisposition to depression. Mm -hmm. Some people inherit the genetic predisposition to migraine. Mm -hmm. And some people inherit both. Wow. <laughs> that's usually the story. That's, that's insane. Yeah. It's a fun thing. Here's how I became interested in headaches. I'm a neurologist, so that's one real. But... I was a second year resident at the Cleveland Clinic. And I had had a headache every single day for a year. It wasn't, you know, I, I dealt with it. I would take Tylenol, I'd take aspirin, I'd be fine. So one day we're making rounds throughout the Cleveland Clinic. <laughs> and every three hours I would stop at the nurse's station and I would ask for either Tylenol or aspirin and they would give me a little packet and I would take it. And the attending doctor, happened to be Dr. Mitsumoto, pulled me aside. He said, why, why are you taking all this pain medicine? I said, oh, you know, I, I just got a headache, no big deal. And he said, how, for how long? I said, a year, get up into my office when we're done. So I go to the office, he examines me, he sends me a scan, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. So he wants to give me a medicine. He said, one more thing, how, who in your family gets headaches? Mm -hmm. And I said, no one. He said, well, I'm not sure I totally believe that. Next time you go home, ask your mother. Yeah. So I go home two weeks later. I'm having breakfast with my mother. I said, Ma, anyone get headaches in the family? Basically. Everybody. Uh, uh, family. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's a genetic thing. Uh-huh. And that piece of information is is also important. Anyway, he, I go back to see Mitsumoto. He puts me on this antidepressant. I wasn't depressed. Mm -hmm. 
10 milligrams. In two weeks, my headache was gone. A headache that I had for over a year. Wow. Gone. Wow. Coming from a neurologist, how important is it to focus on your brain health if you really want to be successful in anything, right? whether if it's a relationship or a job? So, I, th you know, obviously, as a neurologist, I would say that's very important. And the kind of things that are um, most commonly discussed would be, say, for example, do you have high blood pressure and are you treating it? Because if you're not treating it, you can get blockages in the arteries going up to the brain, mm -hmm. cause strokes, little strokes, big strokes. So like, same with high cholesterol. Are you treating your high cholesterol? Mm -hmm. you know, again, just to avoid blockage in oxygen or blood to the brain. Uh, if you're exercising on a regular basis, that limits those kinds of things from happening. If you have an irregular heartbeat, like atrial fibrillation, you have to be aware of this because there's a certain kind of blood thinner that works for AFib where others won't, like aspirin does not. Mm. So being, being aware of your general medical health mm. is huge. Right, so that, that, that uh, portion that may involve knowing your family history health as well? No doubt. Mm. And, and that goes along with not only emotional, mm. but physical. Okay. So are there psychiatric problems that run in your family? Depression runs in families. Bipolar disease runs in families. Mm. If you have that in your family, you have to treat yourself differently than someone who doesn't. Okay. And you have to be aware of those kinds of symptoms and being willing to address them. Mm -hmm. Now, depression is something you brought up as a big topic. A lot of people think, especially like my age, right? a lot of younger people think that depression... Uh, or mostly guys too. Like guys think depression is kind of not a real thing. Like, what what could you have to talk about on that? Yeah, you know, I I run across that often in my practice. I'll see a young man, and you know, I I would say African American men are the worst, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They don't even want to go there. Yeah, they can have every symptom of depression known to man. Damn right, and, <laughs> and it's that's not the problem. <laughs> Yeah. They don't want to take any medicine. They don't want to see a counselor. They don't want to go see a psychiatrist. Nothing. And they suffer. Yeah. They suffer. And it's a long-held view that's difficult to break. I struggle. I, some, sometimes I realize I'm, I'm not going to get through to this person. Mm -hmm. And they're either going to get out of it on their own or they're going to suffer badly. What are the signs of depression that you see so people know that, like, this is real? Like, maybe I'm going through some depression in a way. I, I heard a, a patient the other day say, for her, it's like trying to walk through quicksand on a daily basis. That's, that's and, interesting. And, and I, I've, I hear other people try to describe it, but the, the way she described it, I thought, was, was accurate. Loss of interest, feelings of sadness, mm -hmm. either too much crying or you can't cry at all. Some people with the most severe depression say they can't cry. Mm -hmm. Anxious, can't sleep. Anxious. Mm. Like uh, over worry. Mm -hmm. That's a, wow, I didn't know that was a sign of depression. Yeah. And sleep disturbance is pretty darn common. Mm. And it's usually... You can fall asleep, but then you wake up and you can't get back to sleep. Mm. The thing about depression is, as much as Alzheimer's disease is not really treatable, depression is treatable. Mm. And medications, if they're given at the right dose, and the right cho cho choosing, choosing the right one, can essentially reverse it. Now, how can it do that? Does it is it like almost like alcohol in a sense where it, it stops certain things in the brain from going? The, the classic antidepressants now are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So it blocks serotonin, which at high levels can make you feel depressed. Mm. And 
And most people that get depressed, I mean, there is a situational depression, right? You're depressed because your mother died or Correct. you lose a job or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or you might have a couple things going on at once. Yeah. That's situational, that's reactionary depression. Mm. But a lot of people have endogenous depression. It's from within. It has to do with a chemical disorder that they have absolutely no control of. Wow. So why do you think young black men? Well, to be honest, from my own experience, I feel like uh, it has to do a lot with like trauma, actually, like, like experiencing chronic trauma through childhood and growing up because people that been through a lot of trauma, um, a lot of the times they try to make themselves, they have to seem and make themselves feel like they're more important because a lot, a lot of times they've been feeling like they're down or they're not important in life because of the things they've been through. And I read in a psychology book that to overcompensate for that feeling of not being important or special that... African men or black men feel like they there's nothing wrong. They're powerful. They can achieve anything. And if you know depression, what the heck is that? Like that's not going to stop me from achieving what I want to do. It's right. like overworking is one of those things. That what would you recommend that I say to these young men? <clears throat> I would open their eyes up to self compassion and and actually like the trauma because to be honest, we live in a world where. You know, slavery was a thing for 300 years, you right. know, in America. So we have these, you know, modern day slavery in certain ways or just because we were born into certain circumstances, it's a lot harder. So these, these black men need to really understand that to have self-compassion to things that happen to them and let them know it's really not their fault because that's one of the big blockers that they think they can control everything and, right. and they just know everything. You know, once they understand that and deal with like self-compassion a little bit better then they will be way more open like self-compassion is huge it's huge it's a huge mental thing yeah i feel like once i learned i was able to just like open up and understand like okay right the, <laughs> so like that. that's one way you know i'm not saying that's gonna work for everybody but that's you gotta it's, try it's, something it's a hard uh, thing to deal with but you definitely have to let them know or let them just understand that you understand the history of what they've been through. Yeah.